Hello everyone, my name is Stu Adler. Welcome back to Introductory Lectures in Thermodynamics. During the most recent episodes, we began to explore the role of internal energy in the behavior of a group of molecules, including the roles played by kinetic and potential energy. We also discussed the corresponding states principle, which allows us to make remarkable predictions of the PVT properties of a fluid based on only a few key data points. The question I'd like to begin addressing today is how we put this principle together with measurements of heat and work to map out the relationships of internal energy to other intensive properties, including a full accounting of potential versus kinetic energy. The basic principle that allows us to do this is called the first law of thermodynamics. In short, the first law states that the energy contained in an isolated system cannot increase or decrease. As you're already aware, we use this principle throughout chemical engineering for all kinds of things. The use of this principle for purposes of interrelating properties of a substance is called first law analysis. Before proceeding with any equation statements describing the first law, and in lieu of a static cartoon, I'd like to start with this humorous commercial by Calabrio, a cloud services company. We see a barber attending to one of his client's needs with an array of useful tools. Unfortunately, these useful tools are only useful if you happen to be baking, or putting out a fire, or treating your guests with a string serenade. When applied to the problem of personal grooming, these tools are not so useful. So too with the first law of thermodynamics. Although it is a universal principle that applies in any situation, it takes many mathematical forms depending on the situation. The analogy here is that steel used to make a razor can also be used to make a hand mixer. That does not mean a hand mixer is a razor. So before we can use the first law for solving a problem, we need to first cast it into an appropriate form that makes it a useful tool for our purposes. In chemical engineering, the first law takes many forms. However, in thermodynamics, we usually work with two particular forms, depending on whether the system is a closed or open system. For closed systems, the question we usually seek to address is the following. Imagine we have a control volume containing a group of molecules in a particular equilibrium state, A, with total internal energy, UA. Because the system is closed, no molecules can enter or exit. However, by adding or removing heat, or doing work on the system boundary, we can transform the system over time into some new equilibrium state, B, with internal energy, UB. The question the first law seeks to address is how much the internal energy of the system will change as a result of this transformation from A to B. For open systems, the question is usually a bit different than this. First, our system is not a fixed group of molecules as it is in a closed system. Rather, it's usually a fixed volume of space through which molecules are flowing, often at steady state. Under these conditions, the internal energy and number of moles in our system is not changing with time. However, we may have streams entering and exiting, carrying a certain number of moles of molecules in or out of the system. These molecules carry with them a certain amount of internal energy. In this case, the question the first law seeks to address is how the internal energy of the molecules entering and exiting the system will differ at any given moment in time. Although on the surface this seems like a similar question to the closed system, it's actually quite different. First of all, the focus in a closed system is on the internal energy of the molecules inside the system. With open systems, we often don't care about the molecules inside the system. What we care about are the state of molecules entering or exiting the system. So we're not talking about the same molecules. Also, the difference in internal energy we're trying to quantify is the difference between two different groups of molecules at the same moment in time, not the change of internal energy with time of a single group of molecules. As we'll see in a moment, these differences have a profound impact on how we formulate the first law much like our choice of how to shape steel for different types of tools. In thermodynamics, we often choose to deal with closed systems as a matter of choice in order to simplify the analysis. So let's first examine the form of the first law for a closed system. 
To start, imagine a timeline. At some point in time, we have a closed system of molecules at equilibrium inside a control volume with thermodynamic state A. Over the course of time, we transform this group of molecules into a new equilibrium state B. During this transformation, we input some amount of energy in the form of heat and work. According to the first law, the energy of the universe, which is defined as an isolated system, cannot change. This implies that the total change in internal energy of the system, UB minus UA, must equal Q plus W, where Q is the net flow of thermal energy across the system boundary from the surroundings into the system, defined as heat, and W is the net flow of mechanical or other coherent forms of energy from the surroundings into the system, defined as work. Since in thermodynamics we are usually interested in intensive properties, and since for a closed system the mass or number of moles in the system is fixed, this statement of the first law is often recast in intensive form, with a lowercase q and w representing molar or mass-specific heat and work. Work is often further subdivided into two categories. The first is PV work, often just called work and symbolized by W. This is the work associated with deformation of the control volume. In particular, if the system exerts a well-defined and uniform pressure P along the system boundary, we can calculate the mechanical energy associated with its change in volume, much as we did in trying to understand the van der Waals equation of state. In this case, PV work is given by an integral from state A to state B of minus P dV. As we'll discuss, this definition of PV work is contingent on the transformation path of the system being reversible. We'll define exactly what that means later, but for now it basically means the system must be in an internal state of equilibrium during the entire transformation, with a well-defined equilibrium pressure and volume. The other type of work, less common for closed systems, is shaft work, usually symbolized as WS. Shaft work is so named because it's often associated with a coherent transfer of mechanical energy across the system boundary via a rotating shaft and thus does not involve any deformation of the control volume. The term shaft work is also used as a catch-all for other types of non-PV work, such as electrical work or magnetic work. As an example, imagine we have an ideal gas at 25 degrees C and one atmosphere. We compress the gas isothermally in a continuous state of equilibrium to two atmospheres. What is the net change of internal energy, and how much heat and work must we add or remove from the system to accomplish this transformation? To make it clear what we're talking about, let's imagine the gas as being inside a closed piston cylinder assembly where we can pass heat in or out of the gas through the cylinder and do positive or negative work on the gas via the piston. In the initial state A, at 25 C in one atmosphere, the gas will have a certain volume, given by the ideal gas law. After we compress it to state B, 25 degrees C and two atmospheres, it will have half the volume. As a result of the transformation, it will have a net change of internal energy, delta U, given by UB minus UA. According to the first law, delta U, Q, and W for the transformation are all interrelated by energy conservation. But the properties of the gas itself also have certain constraints on them governed by equilibrium, as we've been discussing the last few weeks. So how do these simultaneous constraints manifest themselves? Recall that for an ideal gas, the internal energy only contains intramolecular kinetic energy, and thus is only a function of temperature. Since in this case the transformation path is isothermal, the temperature is not changing. Thus delta U equals zero no matter how much heat and work there was during the transformation. If we now apply the first law, it says that the heat and work flows must be equal and opposite. If we assume the system was in an internal state of equilibrium along its transformation path, we can calculate the work per mole as an integral of minus PdV from state A to state B. Substituting the ideal gas law, we can solve this integral by calculating VA and VB and integrating. Alternatively, we can also re-express dV in terms of dP and integrate from PA to PB directly. Either way, we get the same answer. 
w equals rt log 2. Plugging in numbers, the work required is 1.7 kilojoules per mole. This implies a heat input of negative 1.7 kilojoules per mole, which is equivalent to a positive output of heat. In other words, to accomplish this transformation as described, we have to add work and remove heat in equal measure. Note that although W and Q are intensive, they are not state properties of the system itself. They are path-dependent quantities that describe the transformation path of the system from one state to another. To illustrate this point, imagine the transformation of an ideal gas that we just examined in reverse. Gas at 25 degrees C in two atmospheres is expanded isothermally in a continuous state of equilibrium to a final state of one atmosphere. Repeating the same steps we just did, we would find that in order to maintain a constant temperature of 25 degrees C, we must input 1.7 kilojoules per mole of heat and extract 1.7 kilojoules per mole of work. In contrast, imagine we have a rigid insulated vessel with the same shape and volume as the final state above. The left half of the vessel contains a vacuum. The right half contains an ideal gas at two atmospheres and 25 degrees C in the initial state that we saw in the process above. This gas is held in place by a thin metal partition indicated by the dotted line. After expanding the control volume to include the entire inside volume of the container, we rupture the membrane, allowing the gas to spread out into the rest of the vessel. Since the system is isolated, the internal energy cannot change by this process, and thus delta U equals zero, just like the process above. It also has the same final molar volume. Since U and V are both state properties, all other properties must also be the same in the final state as the process above, including the temperature and pressure at 25 degrees C and one atmosphere. However, unlike the previous path, this unrestrained expansion involves no heat and no work. The beginning and ending states are the same, so delta U is the same. But the paths are different, so the heat and work are different. All the first law tells us is that heat and work must add up to delta U. It does not prescribe what Q and W are. Our choice of path or other constraints do. The next thing I'd like to address is how to apply these concepts to open systems where material is flowing in or out. To answer this, we basically need to combine two principles. The first is that energy and volume are extensive. The other is the first law for closed systems. To see this, consider a group of molecules contained within a vessel that has two conduits at the top and bottom. Initially, the molecules in the vessel are in state A which in the general case is not an equilibrium state. We then add and remove molecules through the two conduits in some amount, given by the molar quantities N1 and N2. Although the system may not be in a state of equilibrium, let's assume the substances in the two conduits are, and thus have well-defined molar volume V1 and V2, molar internal energy U1 and U2, pressure P1 and P2, temperature T1 and T2, and so forth. In the general case, let us also assume we add some heat and shaft work, symbolized by Q and WS. After some time, and partly as a result of all these inputs and outputs, the molecules in the vessel reach a new state, B. Note that at this point, we have not yet defined our system. If we draw the control volume around the molecules in the vessel only, this constitutes an open system, since material is moving in and out. However, if the vessel is rigid, PV work is zero, because we did not deform the control volume. This is an example of what is called an Eulerian control volume, which involves a system boundary that has a fixed spatial location, and thus fixed volume, symbolized here as V0. In contrast, imagine that instead of defining our system as the molecules in the vessel, we expand the control volume to include the molecules in the vessel plus the N1 moles of molecules in the entrance conduit, indicated here in green. In addition, as the molecules flow in and out of the vessel, let's allow the control volume to deform and follow them, such that no molecules actually cross the system boundary. As the system evolves from state A to state B, N2 moles of molecules that were originally inside the vessel indicated here in blue, will flow out into the lower conduit, 
while the N1 moles of molecules that were in the upper conduit will now be inside the vessel. Meanwhile, the control volume, which has followed the fluid through the vessel, will now be shaped as shown, encompassing the molecules in the vessel plus the ones in the exit conduit. This type of control volume, which flows with a fluid but does not allow molecules to cross it, is called a Lagrangian control volume, sometimes also called a material control volume. The benefit of a Lagrangian system is that unlike an Eulerian control volume, the Lagrangian control volume is a closed system, thus obeys a closed system energy balance, as we used previously. The disadvantage is that it's more complicated to formulate balances this way as a general matter of practice. So for convenience, we actually want to get away from it as quickly as possible, recasting our balance equation in terms of the original fixed but open Eulerian control volume. To do this, we can invoke the first principle I mentioned previously, which is that volume and internal energy are extensive. This allows us to relate the volume and internal energy of the Eulerian system, indicated by superscript E, to the volume and internal energy of the Lagrangian system, indicated by subscript L, simply by adding the extensive volume and internal energy in the two conduits. The other principle I mentioned is the first law for closed systems, which we can apply to the Lagrangian system. In this case, the total change of internal energy of our Lagrangian volume will be a sum of the heat, shaft work, and PV work involved in deforming the volume as it passes through the vessel. Knowing the pressure and volume in the conduits, we can re-express this PV work in terms of the pressure and displacement of fluid in the two conduits. Substituting the extensive relationships we just discussed, we can then relate delta U in the moving volume to delta U in the stationary volume. The result is that the change in the internal energy of the open system will be a sum of the heat, shaft work, and the difference in extensive enthalpy flow in the inlet and outlet streams. If this equation looks unfamiliar, it's because we're still talking about two discrete states A and B in time. To get this into a form we're used to, let's first generalize this to include any number of streams entering or exiting the volume. Also, instead of considering discrete extensive amounts of mass or energy entering or exiting the system, let's put the equation on a per time basis by expressing these amounts in terms of flow rates, Q dot, WS dot, and N dot, and the change in internal energy on the left-hand side as a differential accumulation with respect to time. Finally, if we assume steady state, and thus no accumulation with time, the left-hand side becomes zero. We are then left with the open system balance we're familiar with from steady state process analysis. As derived here, the enthalpy is the total transferable energy carried by a fluid when it crosses a system boundary. This energy is composed of two terms, the internal energy, which is the energy carried by the molecules themselves by virtue of their existence in a particular state, and the product P times V, which is a measure of the latent ability of these molecules to impart mechanical energy to moving surfaces, and which can be converted to other forms of energy inside the system. The quantity PV is sometimes described in textbooks as something called flow work. In my opinion, this is an extremely misleading idea and often leaves students confused about the contribution of PV work in an open system. In thermodynamics, the word work is usually reserved for a path-dependent transfer of energy across a particular boundary. But P times V is a state property of a fluid, so its value is path-independent and does not depend on where the control volume is drawn. As I showed you previously, the PV term does not arise from PV work done on the rigid Eulerian control volume used in an open system balance. It arises from PV work done on a moving and deforming Lagrangian control volume. Once we switch coordinates to an open system, this term is no longer a form of work. As a simple familiar example of an open system balance, consider a stream containing an ideal gas at 25 degrees C and two atmospheres, which flows adiabatically at steady state through a valve exiting at one atmosphere. What is delta H, delta U for this process? What is the heat, PV work, and shaft work? And what is the final temperature in the exit stream? First, before we start, a comment on the use of the term delta, 
to describe the difference in state properties between streams 2 and 1. Often when we use the term delta, we mean a change in properties with time. This viewpoint is fine for a closed system, where we're talking about two states A and B at different times. But here, we're talking about an open system at steady state. If we draw our control volume around the valve, the system we're describing is not changing with time at all. So there is no state A and B to consider. In this case, the delta we're talking about is the difference in properties between the gas outside the system in two different streams, one and two. This means a closed system energy balance is the wrong tool here. We need to start with an open system balance. In this case, since the valve is adiabatic and has no moving parts, we can say that the heat and shaft work are zero. Also, since the control volume is fixed, there is no PV work, by definition. Applying the first law for steady state open systems, and recognizing that the molar flow rates in the two streams are the same at steady state, we are left with H2 equals H1. Turning now to the properties of an ideal gas, we know that enthalpy is only a function of temperature. Thus, no difference in enthalpy between streams 1 and 2 implies no difference in temperature. Internal energy is also only a function of temperature, so must also be the same in both streams. Conclusion, the temperature in stream 2 is also 25 degrees C. Recall that in the closed system we examined earlier, where we slowly and isothermally compressed or expanded the system between 1 and 2 atmospheres, we had 1.7 kilojoules per mole of work. But here we have no heat or shaft work. Although we have the same two end states, the path is not the same. The control volume is not the same, so the heat and work are also not the same. To summarize, in thermodynamics we usually work with two different forms of the first law. The first is for closed systems, where we have a timeline and care about changes in properties of that system as it evolves from one state to another. In this case, we must use a closed system balance that considers the net flow of heat in or out of the control volume and the PV work done on the control volume by deforming it. If this deformation is conducted in a continuous state of equilibrium, where the system has a well-defined pressure and volume, this work is given by minus the integral of PdV. By dividing everything by the mass or moles in the system, we can also easily formulate the first law in terms of the intensive properties and mass or mole-specific heat and work. In contrast, with open systems at steady state, we have a fixed control volume and care about the properties of substances continuously flowing in and out. In this case, we must use an open system balance that considers the net flow rates of heat and shaft work entering the system, and the extensive flow rates of enthalpy into or out of the system carried by substances or streams. Each enthalpy flow rate can be expressed as a product of the mass or molar flow rate times the mass or mole specific enthalpy of the substance or stream. Together, these two statements of the first law are two critically important tools for interrelating thermodynamic properties and analyzing processes involving flows of energy. As we'll see in the next episode, when combined with other tools in our growing toolbox of thermodynamic relationships, the first law allows us to map out the internal energy of real substances by accounting for heat and work we must add or remove to transform those substances from one state to another. However, like many other kinds of tools, the first law comes in different forms tailored for a particular situation, like a Phillips head versus a slot head screwdriver. We need to use the right tool and the right version of this tool if we want to be successful in our analysis.